the GTE spec cars in the last 10 years, they got 10 seconds faster on a 2 minute 20, 2 minute 15 lap. So 10 seconds is a, is a, is a big amount. But the engine power was kept quite similar. So this, this improvement of 10 seconds has to come from somewhere. On today's episode, we are talking to Arne Peters, who is a race engineer for Proton Competition, a Porsche customer racing team running in the high-level racing series. So for those who don't know, it's Tim and Andre here from High Performance Academy. And the topic we're really getting into today is all about a pretty in-depth discussion about some of the differences between uh, GTE, GT3 racing, really what's under the skin in one of those cars. That's something you know you hear a lot of people talking about. Uh, you know, GT3 is a pretty famous sort of sports car series these days. A lot of people know about it, but you know these things are actually probably while they're sort of treated as maybe somewhat of a. I don't know, a boring customer car in some ways. There's actually a lot going on under the skin, one of these things. Yeah, I think uh, on face value, you look at this and then you just uh, pull out your checkbook and uh, write a big old check and go racing. And, and while absolutely you can do that, uh, the the ability to tune these cars and actually optimise their performance on track is um, just like any race car. It, there's, there's a lot going on there. And to get the most out of the car really does require uh, a, a, an in-depth level of knowledge as well, which is really interesting to find out about. Yeah, for sure. And, and like anything else, as time has gone on, these GT3 and GTE cars have become pretty sophisticated. You know, there's Definitely. a lot of tools that have filtered down from high level race series, whether it's electronics, whether it's really sophisticated aerodynamics, you know, there's so it's a lot of detail that's going into tuning one of these things. I think for me, one of the interesting aspects as well, which I still haven't really got my head around is between the GT3 and the GTE, the GTE variant is the faster of the two. Yet the GTE comes with no ABS, and the GT3 cars do. Do, do, you, do you know what that's all about, Tim? Generally, the way it's split is GTE is all pro, sure. normally, and GT3 is designed as a customer racing series. So this is where you get gentleman the, races. The wealthy guy that wants to go racing, he needs yeah. a bit more support. Uh, if you were to throw one of those guys in a GTE car, it's a bit more of an overwhelming challenge. And saying that, you know, if you go somewhere like Le Mans, it, currently anyway, there's no GT3 racing there. There's a pro-am combination, so the gentlemen do have to deal with it in some cases. And in the case of uh, Arne's situation, he is they're dealing with customer racing with GTE in some series. So you know that's a you know probably a pretty impressive hurdle for some of those guys that aren't professionals that are able to deal with those big, you know scary fast cars. That no Definitely, and, and I mean I think the other thing is these aren't sprint races. We're talking sometimes twenty four hour like Le Mans. Uh, sure. endurance races so these are long stints and keeping that concentration and keeping the the car on that that braking threshold consistently corner after corner lap after lap that's uh, that's no mean feat absolutely and remember in endurance racing your no your tires have got to last more than one stint yeah definitely so you go and, and you know you don't have enough tires to do the whole race if you start flat spotting them yeah. So there's a lot of pressure there. Yeah, so it's not just about going as fast as possible. It's actually about looking after the tyres and, and looking at the long game. Absolutely. Yeah, on that, there was a, uh Instagram post that we put out recently actually on the topic of ABS. I find it's always one of those things that uh, a lot of people like, love to stick the boot in when you say, you know, I've got ABS in my race car, or this is the, what does this knob do here that controls? That's the different ABS setting. A lot of people like to say, oh, that's not real driving. You know, it's yeah, it's it's always a hotly debated topic when we talk about ABS or paddle shifted gearboxes, and oh, the, there's always those who are going to jump up in arms and, and say that, yeah, it takes away from the skill of the race driver. Yeah, we're not arguing that. Absolutely. And the post in particular was just essentially talking through, uh, there's like an adjustment knob that essentially every car that has a motorsport style ABS system has where you can tune the level of intervention yeah. that, that comes in with the ABS. And that's normal from both, uh, whether it's different weather conditions, whether you've got different tyres fitted, you might have a wet, you might have a slick, you might have an intermediate option, um, whether it's the level of tyre degradation that you've got, um, you know, how much grip, how much aero grip you've got, all of that stuff. And um, I think it's very easy uh, for people that aren't uh, running a race car and maybe a relatively, you know, to some decent level uh, to appreciate how difficult it, difficult it is to drive one of these things and get the most out of it. And, you know, I I am absolutely a believer that there's nothing, there's no shame in using ABS on a car. Like, it's really hard. Yeah. 
Oh, look, I, I, I'll put my hand up and say we rely heavily on ABS and our Toyota 86, and uh, I'm not ashamed to uh, admit that. Yeah, and yeah definitely there's an aspect of, of driver skill that comes with a non-ABS car. And I think the other aspect that's really important to understand there is these motorsport ABS systems dramatically different to the ABS system that we're likely to find in our road car. And quite often, depending on the tuning of the road car ABS, we actually find that, get that on a racetrack and uh, you can actually end up slowing down quicker uh, if you actually stay away from that AB, ABS sort of uh, manipulation or interjection, if you like. Yeah, absolutely. That's a really good point. The big big difference between a motorsport ABS and a, and a road car ABS. And, and this is something you've experienced with one of your race cars as well, is that um, you know there's a big difference in even road car ABS from one car to another. Yeah. You know, some, some road car ABS is absolutely terrible. And the best thing you can do is pull the pull the big fuse out and stop it working. Definitely. Whereas, you know, GT86, something you run quite a lot, you know, you actually find that quite useful, even with the completely stock factory calibration. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's definitely, you can't sort of paint them all with the same brush and say that they're all good or, or all bad. It's yeah. a, a case of experience, experimenting and seeing how it works. And, and on that note as well, for those who are listening who maybe are interested in learning a little bit more about uh, race driving, improving your performance out on the racetrack, and we do dive a lot into braking technique as well as ABS systems in this course. We've got our race driving fundamentals course that is available. And for listening to this podcast, you can also use the Cooper on code podcast 75 and that will get you 75 dollars off the purchase of your first hpa course we'll put a link in the description there for that course all right tim shall we get into this interview yeah let's do it so today on the podcast we have arne peters who is a data performance and race engineer for proton competition across the world endurance championship the european le mans series imsa and other championships as well welcome to the show arne Hi, hi Tim, nice to be here. Um, so yeah, good introduction. My name is Arne Peters. I'm a Belgian guy living in Germany at the moment. And since this year, I'm a full-time race engineer for a proto competition in both the World Endurance Championship, the European Le Mans series, and I help out as a performance engineer, a strategy support in the IMSA series, uh, mainly the racing only in the, the US and normally Canada, but because of COVID, all racing in Canada canceled. So it has been a busy year. And on top of this, I'm doing our podcast. Uh, what, can you give us a bit of a background? Like what, uh, what degree did you do? What was your sort of path to becoming uh, the, all these different types of engineer we're going to talk about today? So actually my experience was quite, quite limited. Um, I got mainly interested in cars, but mainly technology. When I was doing my master's degree at a university in Leuven, it's a, it's a city in Belgium. Actually, I'm a mechatronics, mechatronic electromechanical engineer. So sensors and, and all this kind of stuff and, and controllers. Um, but I started with the, uh, the first electric formula, uh, student team in Belgium. And I got very interested in tires, simulation, vehicle dynamics, the whole everything around and how to use simulation and, 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 um, and estimations and calculations to make the car as fast as possible without being on the track. Um, and also my master thesis was going about this. So I made a whole vehicle simulation model and a tire model based on all the data I was able to find. I was the only guy mainly interested on this topic on, on, on the entire team. So they were always wondering what is he doing behind his computer and he's, he's always looking at the same screen. So it was a bit of a uh, you know, not not easy, easy time to, co- to convince them. But then three years later, um, when I was already gone for two years, I got a lot of messages and emails because they had questions regarding vehicle dynamics and setup and how to do this. And then, but then it was, I was, I was gone already. So it was, it was not really easy. I just gave them my thesis and that's, that was it. But then after this, uh, I went to Ford, Ford Motor Company in Belgium as a development engineer for vehicle dynamics for the bigger, the bigger vans. So 2.7 till, uh, uh, five tons cars and also as a tire development engineer. So also driving my own tires, tuning the bump stops, tuning the damping, tuning even the, the engine support, uh, support mounts uh, to make sure if there's an effect on the, on the vehicle dynamics or not. And after one and a half year, I, uh, I moved to the US to Optimum G. And I became the, the very inexperienced colleague of uh, a certain Tim White, who's sitting there as well in the podcast. Uh, and I was working for Optimum G for about, uh, I think, three years. Um, and this time I got more involved into racing. Um, 
simulation, racing, engineering support beyond beyond track itself. Um, and then I got involved also in, in Dulop Motorsport. They put me in the team of Proton Competition for the, the World Endurance Championship and Le Mans. But then they changed to Michelin Tire. So they asked me, can you come directly to us as a support engineer? So then I did uh, the next year working for them uh, in all race series, both WEC and uh, the LMS. And then when I left Proton, um, I went directly to, to Proton Competition as, as an employee. And I'm still there. Can we just go back a little bit? You, you mentioned Optimum G, and, and as you alluded to, uh, I think that's where you and Tim met. Tim was working there as well. Uh, can you just give us a, a quick rundown on what Optimum G is and, and what, what's taught there? Optimum G, they do mainly three things. They, they build seminars, they give seminars regarding vehicle dynamics and data acquisition and how to use the data on track or in simulations. They also... Um, Provide, they also develop software, so basic uh, software to, to look into tire modeling, to look into the kinematics of the suspension, to look into um, the first steps of vehicle dynamics. Um, the third thing they do is they, they provide also engineering support uh, regarding KNC rigs, regarding tire modeling on a flat, uh, flat machine. Um, they also do... Uh, on track testing, uh, like uh, sinus tests or step steer testing or brake testing. Um, and also they provide support for racing teams regarding uh, as a performance engineer or a data engineer, for example. Or we also had two guys doing a race engineering in the Brazilian stock car. And uh, that's the main three things they do. Uh, and it's run by an, uh, an old Belgian guy around mid 60s. Um, and he's still doing it at the moment. Before we get into discussing uh, maybe the motorsport stuff in, in detail, I just wanted to pick up on your experience from the OEM world there as well. Like how much, obviously you spent quite a long time working for Ford and developing, I'm sure, lots of different types of vehicles. Do you, How much link do you see there between what you learned developing road cars and, and motorsport? Do you think there's much there or is it really separate? No, it's, it's a bit linked, I think, because... At Ford, it was more more nice because I was the guy driving the tires myself. So if the tire was not good, I, just, I, I had the arguments from my side because I was driving the tires myself. To say to Bridgestone, to Continental, to to Goodyear, to um, yeah, that this this doesn't work or the it's very aggressive or the rear is stepping out or when there's too much load or the pressure is too high or in the snow or in the wet, uh, the tire is not good or there's no good feedback. Um, while on the other side, so from Goodyear Michelin side, um, you always have a driver. He gives his feedback to the engineer, and the engineer is having a discussion with me. So he always has to rely on the feedback he gets from the engineer. So this was much nicer in the OAM side because I was driving the cars myself, tuning, and the, the tires as well. This is not possible in the racing. So this is very, very sad, uh, but it's, it's, it's logical. Um, but in the OAM, I would say they also... They also focus a lot on, on on small details, like even we have two different engine mountings on the computer simulations. The difference is maybe just a few percent, but this can be quite a big step on a, on a passenger van, for example. Um, and also we focus so much on small details. We can feel as, as the development guys from the team, but in the real world, my mom, my, my grandfather, my sister, they will never feel this, but we're still like looking to find like one or two percent better steering on center off center to make sure it's okay but 99.999 percent of the people will never feel this so it's it's both quite detailed but in the racing it's more nice because you work on a short basis you have one race week you have three sessions or two sessions and the result you have already within the week so after the race while working on ea oam you, you work on a project which is it was 2014 and the project was was finished in 2020 so the chances you get the end result to see the end result, it's, it's quite difficult. So this is the main thing I like with the, with the racing and also the biggest difference. It's you have the same technology, you have cars, it's a bit more complicated and, and the racing side, but it's it's going fast and you get immediately the, the, the result what, what you try to achieve. And it's also better to, to, to learn faster because in one week you go from which tires do you use? What's the setup of the car? Is there an issue with the engine? Uh, which gear ages do you want to use? And you go from track to track to track. So every week you, you, you learn something new. And always, if you think it's going to be the perfect weekend, always something is happening. 
so which you're not prepared for, of course. Um, but then it's it's going faster. So this is the biggest difference between OEM and then and racing. It's it's faster. It's also more into detail. Um, and I'm not allowed to drive the cars. That's the biggest difference. So as far as your your roles that you've you've got there at Proton, could you just give us maybe a brief sort of one minute description of each one of those roles, maybe some of the main differences, just for people that maybe aren't as familiar with an engineering structure in a race team? Yeah, so we have a team manager responsible for the two cars, um, or five cars, we have now Le Mans, so it depends. Uh, but then you have a race engineer or a car engineer, we, we more call it, and he's responsible for the communication between um, maybe the chief engineer who is overviewing the, the boat cars as a, on the technical part, the technical director, the drivers and the mechanics. Um, then you have a data or for us, uh, performance data slash engineer, and he's responsible for um, making sure the data is downloaded from the car, the data looks okay, does it see something different in the data, um, how much fuel do we need to take the next 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 stop, um, do we need to take fuel, yes or no, how many seconds do we have to fuel, um, also making sure the, the video, we have an onboard video, if it's, if it's working, if it's on the server available for the drivers to check, and then in every session, Everybody has own responsibilities, and I try to focus mainly on the, just the running of the car. Um, but also, because I said it's a small team, so it's not like an factory team. We don't have five engineers for each car. It's I'm also checking the data myself. I'm also checking, uh, even if the internet drops and nobody knows how it works, I also have to do this. So just to making every, everything running in, in, in the team itself. Yeah, so it sounds like you're wearing a fair few hats there. Across Let's the not forget engines. about the hospitality as well. You're out the oh, back yeah. uh, cooking up uh, dinner as well. I'm always going one day earlier with uh, a few other guys and we build up the hospitality. So it's a big truck with a big kitchen inside. Then you put the floor, the tent, the tables, the kitchen, uh-huh. everything. And then we also have a second trailer. It's, we call it the Corona trailer, which is a, a big trailer where the, the drivers can, they can change and there's some few office spaces. Uh, we call it the Corona trailer because it's the one we bought last year uh, just to get more space because you need to have one and a half meter in between officially. This is also something we have to we have to build up. So it's always I'm always the first there, I think, and the last one to leave. So could you give us, um, across some of the different championships you're working on, so you'll be running, uh, well, certainly in WEC, ELMS, and IMSA, these are all GTE or GTLM, what you call them in some classes. But I think you guys are also running at the Norschleife with the six and 24 hour races there, which is GT3 based cars. So could you give us a bit of a, a high level sort of difference, a description of what a GTE car is versus what a GT3 car is? Yeah. Um, yeah Proton at the moment, we only run GTE or GTLM cars. Um, the last years I did the 24 hour races um, uh, with, the, with a different team, Falcon Motorsport, and this was with a GT3. So Proton at the moment never run a GT3 at the moment, but the biggest difference is, is for yeah, is the price. It's I think it's almost double the price of a GTE GTLM car, um, and it's the whole systems around. So it's a different engine, different different gearbox. Uh, the aerodynamics is completely different, and also the amount of systems is different. In a GTE GTLM car, you don't have ABS, um, but you have more options for traction control. Uh, traction control. The amount, the amplitude, it's 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 interacting. The delay, it's interacting. Um, the steering wheel, it's much more complex now. In the car we have now, it's uh, every two three years there's a new GTE uh, spec available from Porsche, and we have now the latest one, the 2019, it's called, and it's a it's a big improvement regarding steering wheel. We also have multi settings now. Uh, we can turn off the TPMS alarm. We can reset the reference lap time. If there's an error uh, popping up, we can. There's, it's like a Formula One style. They call for Bravo 11 activated or Alpha 4 active, uh, Charlie 7 deactivate. So there's, there's a lot of possibilities now. And the biggest difference is um, with this new car, it's the aerodynamics. So the aerodynamics is quite. Uh, you can you can say as GTE car is an LM, is a GT3 car, but just maybe like on steroids. So it's a bit bigger, it's a bit bit faster, it's a bit more aerodynamics. The power is probably a tiny bit less than a GT3, uh, but it's compensating quite a lot with the, with the GT, with the, with the aerodynamics. For example, on a track here in Austria, the Red Bull Ring, last year we were testing a GTE car, a GT3 car, and a GT3 car was actually faster there because it's mainly braking, accelerating, braking, accelerating, and then just 
two corners which are aerodynamics. Um, so then the GT3 car was actually faster there because the top speed was much higher. Uh, but the aerodynamics of the car was not a, was not playing a big role there. You you said the the GTE actually is slightly lower in power, but in general, you've just given us that example of the Red Bull Ring where the GT3 car did actually happen to be faster uh, in lap time. Um, but in general, GTE is a faster class of car. So are, are they getting that just in terms of the change in aerodynamics you mentioned? Are they going to a lower drag, lower downforce uh, aero package on the GTE compared to GT3? Is is that what I'm sort of picking up there? No, it's it's the car is also it's, it's more heavy as well, um, but the aerodynamics is completely different. So uh, you have much more downforce. So okay. normally in the in in the like Eau Rouge in Spa, everybody knows Eau Rouge in Spa or like the Radio. There you can go flat with the GTE, but you cannot go flat with the GTE because you don't have the downforce. But they have much more. If maybe like 50, 50 or 100 horsepower more, I don't know exactly. So they're just better out of the corner. So a very, like in Monza, for example, it's also very stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. And uh, only one aerodynamics corner. So this is uh, uh, quite a big difference between the two cars. But also the amount of technology and the, the issues, electronic issues you can have with uh, the GTE car, it, it's, it's, it's bigger. But I would say the biggest difference for me is still the price. It's... It's quite, it's quite big. So I think when the LMDH, so the, the, the new hyper class is coming in two years, GTE will, will die, I think. Um, and GT3 will be like in IMSA. They, they all go to GT3. There will be not be a GTLM anymore. Um, it's also quite expensive to to run a GTE car. Um, for the price is already almost a double. You have confidential tires. The, the, the engine is more expensive. The gearbox is more expensive. Um, I think the main reason why there's still GTE driving for private, for customer teams, is because you have customers who just want to drive in the highest class possible. So they don't want to drive a GT3 because it's only GT3 and there's a GTE available. So I want to run in the highest class, even if they they, they don't have maybe the, the, the ability or the, 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 the skills to drive it. Um, they still want to do it because, first of all, they have the money and they just want to spend the money. Yeah, and that's, that's something... That I wanted to point out as well, there's a, quite a big difference in driver aids between a GTE and a GT3, right? Like a, particularly an ABS. So it is for an amateur driver, which obviously we're talking here in sports car racing, largely you're talking pro-am, a pro-am driver combination. It's a pretty big step up for an amateur to be dealing with a GTE car as opposed to a, a GT3. Not only does that you have less driver aids, you also got a lot more downforce, as you said, in the GTE. So suddenly it's your job to exploit all that downforce, which, to be honest, is just a lot scarier. Yes. The, like we had a bit of an analysis a few weeks ago regarding SPA. Um, and the cars in SPA, so the GTE spec cars, in the last 10 years, they got 10 seconds faster on a 2 minute 20, 2 minute 15 lap. So 10 seconds is a, is a, is a big amount. But the engine power was kept quite similar. So this, this improvement of 10 seconds has to come from somewhere. So this is only tires and this is aerodynamics. There's, there's nothing else which is able to propel the car faster. So for pro drivers, this is easier to, to adapt because the cars are more on the edge. There's more downforce. You have to exploit the downforce because to have proper downforce, you have to go fast as well. Otherwise, it's, 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 it's not really useful. And this is also the tricky part for, for amateur drivers or bronze drivers, we call it in, in our series. It's the cars are more on the edge. You have to drive them more on the limit. The tires are getting better as well, but maybe also the degradation of the tires is also getting, getting worse. You have to use the peak of the tire. You have to keep the heat into the tire. If there's a safety car or a slow zone, the tire is dropping. The bronze driver has to, or the amateur driver has to bring the temperature back up. And with, with the, new, the newest spec cars from the last year, it's getting more and more difficult. So it's also we also notice it in, in our team that uh, the, the bronze drivers are sometimes are more struggling than, than the years before with the car in general and to bring the car in the, the best optimal window to perform. The, the window is getting smaller, which is easy for the, the, the pro driver, or the pro drivers always like a bit rear, rear axle loose uh, so they can turn more around and, and more control and drift a bit more through the corners. But for a bronze driver, he doesn't have the, the, the skills or experience or the yeah the, the, the speed or the direction time to, to cover this. 
And this is sometimes a bit uh, the issue we have now. It's more challenging for the bronze drivers um, to drive the car in a, in a, for them a safe way or a competi competitive way. And then there's always a big difference between bronze drivers. Um, the level is pro drivers. They're normally within within a few tenths or within half a second. A pro, a, a amateur driver can go one second slower than between the other ones or even two seconds or even if it's a very an old guy driving for example it can go up to three four seconds so the slower drivers with the less experience the less the less well, i would say the less big balls let's say it like this they, they lose a bit more performance regarding this than the guys who just i point the car i go in the throttle and i see what happens you also have a lot of crazy guys um and they, they dive into every every hole they see <laughs> perfect no, but it's it's. I'm, I'm just being honest here. It's like it's like it is at the moment, and this is it's it's, it's making it quite. Oh, I can I can understand. It's too scary. Yeah, but and this is you have you have a lot of bronze drivers, amateur drivers. They come from LMP3, LMP2, so they have to use downforce there because the the the, the, the prototype cars in very tight corners. They are nowhere. They have no mechanical grip. It's mainly the high downforce side and the top speed they they have. So they have to get used to downforce. But these guys, these drivers, they come now to GTE driving because maybe they won everything already in the prototype car class. They they are used to the, to the, the aerodynamics and they know how to use the aerodynamics. Um, so and this is this is making this is a, a trend we see like in the last year, two years, quite a lot. So if the new class, the LMDH hybrid class is coming and there's only GT3 and then the LMDH and you have customers in the LMDH, which is hybrid. Uh, Four-wheel driven, um, more aerodynamics, different brakes, ceramic brakes maybe, or carbon brakes. Uh, it's 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 going to be quite a challenge, I think. So this is something in the future. I have no idea how it's going to go. So I want to touch on what you were talking about there with the difference on Pro and M. <clears throat> One of the questions I had thought about before we started recording was, uh, what's your philosophy as far as setting up the car? I mean... Obviously, the pro is always going to be ex extract more out of the car, so you want to, you need to be able to exploit everything the car's got. But at the same time, you may well be able to give the pro the car they want, and it may be very difficult for the amateur then to drive the car at all. So, how do you guys normally approach uh, tuning a car? How do you sort of decide to bias it between what the pro wants and and what the amateur needs? Yeah, so um, like with I have two different bronze drivers now. Um, and they, I drive with them already for two years, and I've with another guy already for four years. So I know a bit what they want, what they prefer, uh, which is no oversteer. Um, the pro driver always likes a bit of oversteer, but I also have, I can use two very uh, experienced professional pro drivers, and they know their bronze driver, and they know this is this is good for them. So this is also a difference. You can't put every pro driver with a bronze driver because they they cannot translate their experience or their technique or their feedback regarding the car or the track or the, the weather conditions or even the changing conditions uh, because there's more rubber coming down on the track with the bronze driver. So not every pro driver can can work in a customer series like like we do, for example. It's 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 a big, big difference. Um, and what I always do, like the last races, it's always every session I start with the pro driver. I check the condition of the car. I check the, the, the track conditions. I do a few runs just to check if uh, the setup is okay, and then we improve every time the setup a tiny bit. And at the point he says, car is good, it's good to drive, it's stable, the rear is stable, this is for me very important. Then the bronze car, uh, the bronze driver goes in and he does laps to get used to the car, the brakes, the track, the traffic. And then we have the third driver, it's normally a pro AM, it's a silver driver for us. He's just finishing the, the stint to make sure we can do a full stint on the tires. This is normally always the format I use. Um, but for this year, the car we have now, it's a very improved aerodynamics. So the GT Porsche uh, RSR 2019 has a very strong uh, front axle. So the rear axle has always been quite challenging. And so we always try to focus on the rear axle to make the rear axle stable for the, for the, 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 the bronze driver, the amateur driver. Because on the high speed part where you gain the time, um, this is where we need to have the bronze driver working. And also the bronze driver is for me more important than than, uh, than the pro driver. The bronze driver is always driving much longer. So in a, in a six hour race, the bronze driver has to drive minimum one hour, 45 minutes. And the pro driver only has to drive 45 minutes. 
So the bronze driver is doing two stints and the pro driver is doing one stint, maybe maximum two. Um, so in the end, the bronze driver, if we can gain the bronze tie, if we can bring the bronze driver up to speed and he's gaining half a second or even one second a lap, it's much more than we can gain with the pro driver. He maybe can gain maximum, maximum half a second a lap. Uh, but in the end, the bronze driver is the one driving the longest in the beginning of the race. And normally the car is always quite good for, for the bronze driver and for the pro driver in my case. Um, but it's the, the biggest difference is they, they have to drive the longest. They have to feel comfortable with the car. And in the end, they're the customers. So they also they pay they pay for the car and the, the race and the things. So they also have to be happy. So for me, it's, they have to be comfortable and they have to be happy in the end. So essentially, just to recap and sort of tighten that up, your, your philosophy there is to establish a setup that the, the bronze driver is, is comfortable with and can go fast with, and then the pro driver will adapt to, to that setup, uh, even if it's not quite a, an optimal setup for the pro driver. Yes. If you go for a pro driver in, in quali, you increase the rake, you go up with the wing, you make it uh, lower on tire pressures, uh, but for, the, for to drive like this for one hour, it's also not possible. Um, and for the pro drivers, we always give them a bit less tire pressure. Or if they have if a bit too much understeer, then we we change the front the front uh, tire pressures, for example, to make it a bit more competitive. But in the end, at the end of the, the race, the track is getting rubbered in, so it's also getting a bit faster, and the. the the, the pro drivers they can change or adapt their technique quite a lot. So they can, if they want a bit more rotation, then they trail brake more longer into the turn. Then the rear axis more or less more, like, the chances of the rear axis stepping out is a bit higher. So then they can rotate the car a bit more. They also have a better feel for for TC settings, brake bias, um, traffic wise. So in the end, they get paid for this, um, and they have to drive with the car we give them. But they can more drive if they have an issue like regarding understeer, oversteer, or aero wash. They can drive around the problem much more easy than a bronze driver. So the bronze driver is always the best car for them, and the pro driver can make the car also competitive. For me, in in any case, every time the pro driver was able to be very fast as well with the, with the setup of the bronze driver. In terms of making setup changes to a factory built race car like this what what are your tuning options available and, and what would you be looking to change during a race weekend to adapt the car to suit the the driver we have a lot of things to change we can um, even from the smallest things we can put more weight in the front we can put more weight in the cockpit we can put more weight on the subframe on the axles um, we can play with right heights uh, right heights front left front right we left rear right we can play with uh, the splitter um, to make it straight. We can in the in the past race cars in the past years we can make it nose up, nose up, even nose down. Um, we have of course camber, toe, wing settings, brake blanking. It's also very important to make sure the brakes are always not too cold, not too hot. Too hot they will wear out quite a lot. When it's too cold they can break or they can just not perform properly. Um, there's even engine blanking to make sure we have the most optimal temperature for the engine. But there's a lot of things to do. You can you can also even change uh, uh, play with the, with the tire pressures. With the tire pressure, just you lower them 0.1 bar, then the car feels completely different. So then the tires are maybe proper in the window. You can even play with a soft tire on the front, medium tires on the rear, soft tires on the right side, medium tires on the left side. You can you can do any combination you want. You can play also with the shift lights if the acceleration is not properly or they're hitting the ref limiter too much. You can play with the shift lights. There's a lot of things. We also have a lot of sensors in the car. We also have uh, damper forces, uh, so we also can see how the aerodynamics affecting. We also even have a splitter the, the deformation sensor, so we know if the splitter is working yes or no. If the splitter moving, then it means we're sucking down the car in the front. Is not moving, and we know it's not really really helping. Um, there's also of course the the damping, the the spring rates, and the bump stop caps is also quite important uh, tuning part we we can use. To make sure the front and rear axle are connected when you go braking or on the high downforce parts. Um, did I forget something? What about kinematic options? I think maybe maybe the RSI has kinematic options to put the suspension arms in different positions. 
Yes, we also have this at the moment. The good thing is this car, it's, it's only available for customers after one year driven by the, the factory teams. So they always, in one year, they, they test also, they improve hardware, they improve software, they improve certain certain parts of the car as well, different design as well. Um, and we can change the kinematics as well. I, I, I believe we're not really allowed to, to do a lot of things on this. We cannot do it without, without noti notifying them. But you can change um, the roll center. You can move the rear roll center, for example, more up or down. You can increase the, the anti-dive, uh, the anti-squat, uh, this kind of stuff you can all change. And the previous question, I forgot, the diff, there's also still a diff with the preload, the ramp angles for uh, throttle, braking, of throttle, coasting. So this is also a quite big part. But the kinematics, yes, we can change them. I, To be honest, I didn't do anything yet about this year because for me it was always quite, quite good uh, because for this car, the front aero is, is very good if it's working. Uh, so this is the main the, the thing we have to make sure it's working. And kinematics at the moment, um, maybe we have to change them by the end of the year uh, if we go to different tracks. Um, but this is depending on the on the, the factory support if they have experience about this, yes or no. Because we, we we don't have the possibility or the capabilities to put a car on a KNC machine uh, and see what's the best the kinematics or on a or a seven post trick what's the best uh, the optimal damping clickings or uh, a spring stiffness uh, so this is a bit uh, the lack we have of, of information and, and experience and possibilities regarding this could you just go going back a little bit there describe exactly what you mean by a knc rig yeah so um knc rig you can put a car on it so you put a car on i think it's like four posts you you attach sensors to the chassis, to the the tires, to the rims, uh, and then you you move the car around. You bounce it up, you bounce it down, you bounce it to the left, right. You roll it, you pitch it, and then you see how the car is reacting, how the tires are moving regarding to the rim, to the chassis. Uh, you can analyze the entire uh, vehicle behavior of the car. Um, you can also simulate uh, downforce, for example, by clamping the chassis on the bottom. And you can push it down to see is most of the the energy of the of the of the downforce is it going to the damping into the springs into the uh, maybe even bending of the chassis it's also even possible if the chassis was not designed well uh, how much energy is going to the tires for me the only big disadvantage is the tires are cold which is a big 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 difference on the racetrack uh, hot tires are completely different you can even warm them up but it's it's a different world if you're really driving your tires are rotating and driving uh, and then wind coming from the front, the rear, the back, the side, the top. So it's it's, it's quite a big difference. But again, seem rig is it's interesting, but you need to know how to you need to know how to use it and how to use the data and analyze the data as well. So it's it's really about obviously every suspension geometry. You know, when you're doing a basic analysis, you're kind of assuming everything's rigid. But the K and C rig sort of thing, allowing you to see how everything, all the angles and arcs and everything's really moving when it's actually loaded up, which can be quite different, but it's obviously a lot more of a complicated sort yes. of analysis to do. Yes, it's KC is for kinematics and compliance. So you want to know how is the car moving if I push it down with, uh, let's say, what, 500 kilograms of downforce, or when you take a, a corner with a two or three G, how is the car moving? So where where is the, the movement going to? Where's the energy going to? Even the steering rack, the steering, if you start steering the car, maybe the steering rack is bending as well. And you have no idea. And I can tell you from the racetrack and the car is not doing what you expect it to do. And you su suspect there's something bending in the car. Uh, good luck finding it out on the track. It's, it's, it's not easy. <laughs> do you do you rely, you've, you've said you sort of maybe aren't using all of those tuning tools that are available at this point, but with such a broad range of potential adjustments, I can only imagine it would be very easy to go in the wrong direction and, and end up moving away from the, the sort of performance envelope you're aiming for. Do you rely on any uh, simulation tools to sort of help you understand what sort of setup is going to be suitable for a particular track? Um, no, the simulation for us, we get uh, we get a pre-event always from uh, from the manufacturer, and he gives us sensitivities. So if you change the aerodynamics, how much is the top speed going to be affected? What which corner is very important? Which corner uh, in which corner can you gain the most performance? Um, what's the effect of uh, the weight? So for 
10 kilograms, for example, you, you lose or you win uh, one, tenth of a, uh, uh, one tenth of a second. They do some simulations also for us, the tire supplier. They also do some simulations to see where's the energy of the car going to. For example, I now came from Monza, which is uh, more or less right hand side turns all the time, right, 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 right side. So did it make sense to put a bit more time and, 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 and performance on the left side of the car? So increasing the cambers, making sure the tire pressure is not getting too high, but also not too low because then you get too much movement. So this is small bits of, of, of simulation. But um, we also have spec finder from, from uh, Multimatic, which is to, it's, it's not a, I would call it like a, a real, but also a simulation tool to see what damper clicks are going to affect what on the, on the damping. Uh, like low speed, high speed, blow off, uh, rebound, bump, all this kind of stuff. We've talked here about all the different things you can touch. What do you think the most two or three common tools are that you'd be using when you're chasing like a balance issue? Like, are we talking, is that you more often to use like a, maybe a small camber change, a tire pressure change? Like what are your biggest tools that you make use of? I would I would say like right height, just to make sure the, the rake and the platform, because like I said, it's an aerodynamic, it's quite a, an aerodynamic car. Then if you talk about aerodynamics, you talk about the platform. So front right height, splitter, rear right height, to make sure this is this is in the window. Um, because if you're not in the window, then you can do whatever you want. Camber, stow, uh, everything. Bump stop caps, if you're not in the window of the aerodynamics, it's 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 not making any difference. So this is always the first point is keep the keep the platform in general, like spring stiffness you keep. And the first thing we always try is What's the, the, the platform? How do we get into the, the, the window of the aerodynamics? And then if we know, okay, we have the top speed, we have the we have the rake we want, we have the the cornering speed, and then you try to, if the baseline is there, then you need to find out what's the tires you want to use, soft or medium, medium or the hard tire. And then you start fine tuning with a bump stop cap or uh, a damper clicking there, or again, maybe with one millimeter uh, right height, just changing the conditions if it's getting more hot. So for me, I would say uh, the right heights are the first thing to, to make sure the aerodynamics is in the window. You've just mentioned uh, bump stops there and bump stop gaps, and that goes hand in hand with your aerodynamics on the platform, as you've, you've mentioned there. So you're using those bump stops to help control the, the ride height and the high speed sections of a, of a track where that downforce is going to essentially try and push the car into the racetrack? Yes, bump stops are quite um, tricky sometimes. Um, but as an example, in Eau Rouge, there's a big uh, like compression on the bottom and then you go up. It's the same as in Portimao, the last turn. Um, and if you go in a very high compression, you need to make sure the front and the rear axle are, are synced. So if the front axle is, is hitting the bump stop, for example, faster than the, than the rear one, then you create a lot of understeer. But if the rear is, is, is hitting the bump stop first, then you create maybe a lot of oversteer. So you have to make sure that in braking or in, in high speed uh, cornering that uh, the car is synced front axle to make it as neutral as possible. Uh, so to make sure the drivers, they, they're not scared when suddenly the balance change is shifting in high speed, because this is something you, you definitely want to avoid is, is a big, is going from entry understeer to, to mid corner oversteer and to back to understeer on the exit. You don't want to have all the balance shifting uh, in one corner. You want to make it as predictable, as linear, as, as stable as possible, uh, and just to make sure the driver feels good and can go on the throttle as early as possible, but not uh, fighting like hell to, to be able to make the corner, but this lap by lap, because it's still endurance racing. If it's a sprint race for two hours, then the drivers can survive. But if you do a six hour race or, or a 12 or a 24 hour race, the drivers have to drive hour by hour by hour. So they also have to be sure like they can, can do it physically. So remember a few years ago, there was the Bathurst race with uh, Matt Campbell driving. And he was, was, I think, was in the cockpit 40 degrees. Outside, it was 40, 50 degrees. Tractive was uh, out of the roof. He was fighting like hell. But he was also completely, completely dead afterwards. So it's, it's just, uh, it's, a fine, it's a fine line. Um, but it's also the decision by the driver itself. But it's, you, meet, you need to make sure the car is predictable. Because otherwise, it's uh, also for, even for the bronze, the bronze drivers, it's, it has to be predictable. Uh, and I would say in the most linear way as possible. So they know what to expect, uh, especially if you lose the downforce on this type of cars, then the balance is completely different, completely gone. And then it's then it's a struggle to 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 
to do what you want to do is to make the corner as fast as possible and break at the same point. When you're talking about making ride height changes uh, to affect the your aerodynamic balance, what sort of magnitude of are we talking here? If, if you've got like maybe a, a moderate or a small to moderate balance shift you need to make, if you were going to make a change on the front axle, for example, what sort of order of magnitude are we talking about in terms of making a ride height change? Talking about one millimeters, like one, two millimeters. That's that's the magnitude. So it's it's quite small. Like with the previous generation cars, it was probably about um, two, three, four millimeters. The rake was also much higher, but now the, the for example, if the rake was 30 millimeters last year, maybe now the rake is 15, 60 millimeters. So it's it's half of the rake. So also four millimeters last year to make a shift is now maybe going to two millimeters. Um, so it's I would, I would talk about half a millimeters. I would like to do half a millimeter as well, but we don't have the, the right shims to do this. So it's millimeters. I complained already to my mechanics, but I don't get anything else. In terms of uh, the data system you've got on the car and, and sensors, what, what have you got there and what are you looking at? Um, we have a Cosworth system. So we use Pi Toolset, Pi Toolbox, um, and the, the, the Porsche support people, they also use Bosch. But it's, we have a, a tool set, so it's, it's a software setup for the car. So it's telling you what shift lights do we have, what's the fuel alarm, what's the calibration of all the sensors, what's the offset of the sensors, um, what's the reference lap time. Uh, and this is, this is every time flashed, every race, uh, or every, if, if we change something on the, the data logger and on the steering wheel as well, because the steering wheel is also integrated in the whole system now. So it has a, a very complex um, program and, and possibilities. And looking into the, the sensors, we have we have a lot of sensors. We have ten, ten, ten of sensors on the, on the engine, uh, gearbox, temperature, uh, all this kind of stuff. But this is mainly for the, the the performance side of, of Porsche, who are responsible for the engine and the, the, the gearbox. But you, we look mainly to the ride heights. We look mainly uh, tire pressure, tire temperature to see we're not overusing the tires. Um, we also have, yeah, of course, the speed, the GPS location, the throttle braking, uh, damper pots to see what's the movement of the car compared to the ride heights to see what's the, how much is the tire moving. Um, in the IMSA, we also have a track temperature sensor, which is also interesting to use uh, because then you get a live update about the condition of track. Uh, but then the, the, the amount of sensors we have, it's for me, I think it's quite, it's not too much, but the, what you can do with all the sensor data. So for example, with the damper pots, the damper tension meters, you get the move, the travel of the dampers, but you can make it a speed and acceleration to see do we have vibrations on the damping or we have an issue, the damper is breaking down um, with the, the throttle and the, the braking. Okay, a lot of people, they just think you just see the braking or the throttle, but you can also see, is he overlapping? Is he, is he fuel saving or not? Uh, is he aggressive? Is the tire at the end of his lifetime? Because he's going a bit more gentle on the brakes, a bit more gentle on the, on the throttle. Uh, this is the data we use, they're more called the KPI. So team is also aware of this. Um, it's just to make as much use of the data as possible. Um, uh, but also, as a side note, we don't want to make it too complicated because I'm in a customer racing team uh, with the pro drivers, yes, but talking about damper speed, accelerations, uh, trail braking, off brake speed, uh, all this kind of stuff you can calculate. Um, you need to be careful with, with the bronze driver because you don't want to overload them because if they start thinking too much, then, then it's, it's never a good thing. When you talked about uh, one of the sensors you listed, there was ride height. Is this using like a laser ride height sensor that's built into the floor? Yeah, we have four of them. Um, uh, the, the main challenge with the ride height sensor, sensor is where do you calibrate it to? So you calibrate normally to the, the floor, but with our car now, it's quite of a tricky, tricky one. So we have also a skid block on the bottom of the car, and this is now used as a reference plane. But the skid block is being getting used, of course. So then the calibration... The gain, we keep the gain for the entire year normally, but then the offset is always a bit different because we still have mechanics measuring the right heights. They, they lay underneath the car, they measure the right height, but maybe on, on, in the morning they measure 45 degrees, uh, 45 millimeters, but in the afternoon they, they maybe measure 
46 or 47 because the light is different or the ruler is a bit different or they look at it differently so it's it's still quite quite uh, difficult or sensitive to get the uh, it's not like an lmp car um so that's why i'm not allowed to use half a millimeter right head shims because the tolerance of the ruler for example it's only one millimeter so do you think uh during a race weekend what would the most common sensors you'd be making you'd be paying attention to particularly when looking at maybe driver performance like i assume a lot of your time is probably taken up trying to help help your amateur drivers um you know get a bit closer to the pros so as far as driver inputs what are the main things that you tend to make use of and what are the sort of main driving differences you tend to see between your pros and your amateurs yeah the, so when the car goes out of the pit lane the first sensors we always check it's a uh, right height in the pit lane so we have an idea of what's the the current rake right height and also if it's matching the values we have on the setup pad and then also what we use during the run it's the type tire uh, sorry the brake temperature to make sure the brakes are also okay in the window but then regarding the bronze drivers and the, the pro drivers it's of course the brake throttle steering speed and the gears to see how are they braking are they braking early later are they braking late because they think I have to brake late so to gain time, but then they get stuck into the corner. If you have a left right hander or two corners in a row, they always go for the first corner, but the second corner has the exit. So you always have to focus on the second corner uh, or they go in between corners. They go full throttle because they think, oh, I'm going too slow. I have to, I have to pick up the pace. They go full throttle. But then they create a lot of understeer in the second corner and then the exit is very, very poor. So I would just mainly say about it's it's where they brake, how they brake, how they do go off the brakes, and then the timing wise, when do they start steering, when, when do they start steering and going on the throttle. Uh, it's this, in this this line of timing, it's it's very, on a video, you, you cannot see this most of the time, but it's just like, it can be like five meters later steering and only like five degrees, just to rotate the car a tiny bit more to have a better exit. And this is the feel the pro drivers have, have easier or they, they also try it in the simulator, for example. Um, but it is something we try to teach teach the, the bronze drivers as well. But it's it's just the main need to drive the driver sensor. So steering, brake, throttle, speed. And this is also for them the most easy to understand because this is they they are responsible for this. So they have they have they have a, an effect on this. So if they want to go faster, they go more on the throttle, they know okay, I have to go on throttle. But if I go on throttle, but I've understeer like hell. Then the TC is, is 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 cutting the engine, so then it doesn't make sense. So I have to rotate the car first and then go on throttle. So it's just trying to to in, to translate uh, the performance of the pro drivers to to the bronze driver. But just for this, like my bronze drivers, they're only interested in this. If I talk to them about the bump stop caps and synchronizing the front rear axle and uh, the brake temperature, then 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 they're, then they're lost and it's not their not their job. It it really sounds like you know, this car's got an enormous number of setup options, but also a really complicated car. If you could have one extra tool or change one thing about the car in order to make your job as an engineer easier, what do you have anything in mind what that would be? An extra tool. Now, at this moment, I would like to have a bit more a bit more engine power. Nothing I can do about this. <laughs> no, the thing is, this, this, <laughs> who wouldn't want more power? <laughs> no, this car it's 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 designed for a very good aero. So, um, for me personally, if you're alone on track in a quality lap, it's it's a good car because there's nobody in front, nobody behind. Um, but the problem is, with, if you have an aero car, if the tires are getting worse and worse through the stints, the performance is also going down. But if you have a if you have a good engine and a top speed, even with with tires which are completely worn out, you still have the top speed. And on the straights is where you overtake overtake the, the other cars. So for example, last year in Le Mans, the Aston Martin, we were trying, we were we were behind the Aston Martin, we were trying to get a slipstream, we were like one meter behind, but we cannot even hold the slipstream. So the Aston Martin just pulls away and then it's an easy pull away because if you're a pro driver, a bronze driver, if you if you if you have the top speed, you go on throttle, you're gone. But then it's a very skilled car, the Porsche, because it's it's a very good car, but it's it's very focused on cornering, and the tires are a big impact on this. What's the one thing you're you think about this? The one thing you're always complaining about on the car? I think one there's one thing that they should fix on this car. No, it's, for me, it's now the engine power because the racing monster was a disaster. 
<laughs> no, but because they, <laughs> no, because they, they focused a lot on the front aero. That the rear is sometimes it's very tricky. The main focus always the rear axle, the rear axle, the rear axle to make sure the rear axle is stable. Uh, and when you, when you start sliding with that with the with the rear axle, the tires heat up, the tires worn out much faster, and then it's getting worse. So it's it's uh, I would say like. What I really like is, for example, on the Ferrari or even on the Aston Martin or the Ford, it's, they have a very good balance front rear. Like the aero balance is very, very good. Uh, the distribution is very good and it's very easy to drive. It's very easy on tires and it's very uh, easy to drive also for a bronze driver. The Aston Martin as well, it's, it's, it has a good aero, but when you go out of the corner, it just squats down and the acceleration is there. It's just a very safe car for, a, for, a, for an amateur driver. And this is what I what I like as well. I, I guess with what we've talked about so far, and there has been a bunch, uh, is there anything you feel like we've overlooked that uh, that you think's really important to to getting the the lap performance out of the car? Um, part for us in the in any race, so six, twelve, for twenty four hours, it's strategy, um, and because we have we always have three drivers in the car, and they all three have different driving times. So the bronze driver is, for example, in a six hour race, it's one hour 45. The silver is one hour 45. The gold is 45 minutes. So you have to adapt to, okay, we how, how long does the bronze driver drive? Because we don't want to make him drive too much because then we, we lose maybe a bit of uh, like performance on track. Um, but you want to make sure he's driving the first. So if there's a safety car or you're in the lead lap, then you, you come back together. But for example, in in an eight hour race for us, the bronze driver needs to drive two hours 20, which means it's two stints plus 20 minutes. So then he's actually need to drive three laps, three stints, which is three hours. So for us, it's not only about performance of the car, but it's also performance regarding strategy wise to make sure you exploit everything as much as possible. You want to make sure that the, the, the bronze driver is always at the beginning of the race with good tires uh, and trying to make sure he's, he's following the pack or even fighting for uh, with the, the front runners. Uh, but for us, it's also strategy wise. It's it's quite a big, big step. Like in Monza, my car was at quite a big uh, uh, top speed deficit and just just only with with, with a strategy and and, uh, um, and, a, and a safety car, luck for a safety car, we got P5 and I think we were more or less the slowest car on track. So from, I think, 14, 15 cars. So this is also purely strategy-wise. So it's not only about setup, but also making sure the drivers are well-rested uh, and putting the correct driver at the correct time with the correct tires. Uh, because if you put the pro driver with the tire pressure is too low or too high, for a 24-hour race, he stays two hours on the same tires, then good luck, have fun, and just watch the competition drive away. So... so- it sounds like you've got a lot on your plate at the moment. You're wearing quite a few hats uh, across quite a few different race series. What What do you think is in the future for you? Are you pretty happy with what you're doing at the moment? Do you see yourself maybe moving into a bit of a different role, or what do you see in your career going forward from here? Um, yeah, the the big thing is I always told to everybody if I have a family, I will I would not do racing because I'm going too much too much. Um, the good thing is I met my girlfriend while I was doing racing. So she's only used to this, me doing racing. So she told me just to keep doing it. Um, because for me, the good thing is when I'm home, I'm home. Okay, I have to work from home. Uh, but I don't have to go to the, the office or the workshop every day. But then I travel to races. But this year is completely different because it's the three race series and then testing in between and I have five cars in Le Mans. So it's getting a bit too busy probably. Uh, but this is the first year I'm full-time race engineer. Uh, we had different tires in the LMS, so different Goodyear tires, new tires, a completely new car, which is very complicated and much more complicated than the previous cars. So I'm just trying to get up to speed and try to just do the best I can. Um, and at this, until this point, every race, the car was from my job. So balance wise, setup wise, uh, preparation, the car was always in the window. It was competitive. But then due to external factors, uh, we got hit a few times by other, by other cars. Uh, we had a drive shaft uh, issue a few races ago, so it's always something. It's not have been the best year, but I would say at, at the moment I like it. I still learn a lot. This is for me the more, most important thing. I still learn. I'm still only I'm, I'm 31 years old, so I still have a, a lot of things to learn, of course. 
at the moment, LMDH is also coming around the corner in one, two years. And Proton, at the moment, they want to, to participate in this as well, both in Europe, uh, as, in the, as in the IMSA, probably. Um, so I want to see where it goes and, and see which role. But I'm now the race engineer, so I, I don't have the ambition to be technical director or team manager or starting my own team. I don't, I don't have the, the need for this. So. But I just let's see what, what's, what's coming on. So I don't know. At this moment, if you ask me honestly, what would you do if you don't do racing? I have no idea. And this, my girlfriend also know. I have no idea. <laughs> Stick to racing for the time being then. Could uh, could definitely be in worse positions. Uh, what Given what you've learned and your path to get where you are right now, if there's someone listening to this podcast who aspires to be a race engineer doing what you're doing, what advice would you give them to to fast track their their sort of direction? Yeah, the thing is, I would I would say if you can work in racing, it's always interesting. But then um, try to 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 listen and just look around and and see what everybody's doing and just take notes and and try to take in all the information. Um, but always try to be open as well for for different opinions. So. There's always old school people racing. They use a paper and pen or they don't use simulation or they, they stick to certain protocols and procedures, but always try to, to, to do something different or innovate or, or, or try to do something new. So don't always copy, uh, copy what other people are doing, but every, I believe every engineer has his own style of running a team, communicating with the mechanics, communicating with the drivers. Um, everybody's his own style and this is also for me this this year I'm, I'm developing my style um, how to do it um, and just always always uh, be respectful for for the other people uh, and respect their opinions as well but just always try to develop your own style this is for me this is quite important this year and and even if it's mechanics or your tire guy or, or a, a driver change helper guy or the, the guy who's changing the, the bottle, the water bottle, it's it's a whole team. Solid advice. If uh, if people want to follow your exciting life traveling around the world doing all of these exotic races, how can they how can they do this on the social media? Yeah, I uh, I had I have an Instagram, but um, the last the last picture is from I think August two thousand. 19. The, the reason I have this Instagram is because I took pictures. For, <laughs> Quite up to date. Yeah, yeah, so you're going for it. I went to a, every time I went to a racetrack or a different location for work, I took a picture and I put it there so my mom would be able to see and know where I was because she never knew where I was. But after this, I stopped doing this because I went all the time to the same racing tracks. And as, a, as an engineer, everybody every, <laughs> everybody thinks you, you see the entire world and oh, you have a lot of free time when you're traveling, but you see the airport, the plane, the hotel and the racetrack. That's all you see. So if you go to the racetrack three times a year or three times, three years in a row, yeah, the pictures are always the same. So I just stopped taking pictures. Maybe not always as glamorous as everyone thinks. Definitely not. No, no. It's long days. Uh, some, most of the time it's good food, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's a lot of uh, traveling. But I still use my Instagram to, to, to follow other people, racing people, my drivers, uh, uh, technology, uh, I follow this, so if they want to contact, they can, they can contact me on Instagram. It's it's p dot arne. This is my uh, my Instagram account. Hey Arne, thanks very much for your time tonight, mate. It's um it was a really interesting chat. Yeah. All right, thanks uh, thanks a lot for your time, Arne. Thank you very much for having me. All right, that concludes our interview. And before we sign off, I just wanted to mention for anyone who's been perhaps hiding under a rock and hasn't heard of High Performance Academy before, we are an online training school and we specialize in teaching a range of performance automotive topics, everything from engine tuning and engine building through to wiring, car suspension and wheel alignment, uh, data analysis and race driver education. Now remember, you've got that coupon code. You can use podcast75 at the checkout to get 75 
$25 off the purchase of your first course. You'll find our full course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses. Important to mention that when you purchase a course from us, that course is yours for life as well. It never expires. You can rewatch the course as many times as you like, whenever you like. The purchase of a course will also give you three months of access to our gold membership. That gives you access to our private members only forum, which is the perfect place to get answers to your specific questions. You'll also get access to our regular weekly members webinars, which is where we touch on a particular topic in the performance automotive realm. We dive into that topic for about an hour. If you can watch live, you can ask questions and get answers in real time. If the time zones don't work for you, that's fine too. You're going to get access as a gold member to our previous webinar archive. We've got close to 300 hours of existing content in that archive. It is an absolute gold mine. So remember that coupon code PODCAST75. Check out our course list at hpacademy.com forward slash courses.